my husband's voice, but I couldn't see him anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I heard his voice, and all of a sudden, I, saw, I was like, oh, there he is. So I'm right back in the back anyway. church. I am so thankful that God loved me, even though he knew everything that I was ever going to do. And he loved me anyway. That is really, really comforting to me. Welcome to church this morning. Whether you're joining us here in person or online, we are so glad you are with us. If you are online, drop us a little comment. Tell us hi. Tell us where you are listening from. We want to get in touch with you, get to know you a little bit, and connect with you. So please stand and join us. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you.
Amen. That's the God that we're here this morning to worship. Give someone a hug or handshake before you have a seat. And welcome them to church this morning. Hey, dear. You may be seated. And welcome to church this morning on this beautiful fall morning. Um, it's great to have you here, whether you're in person or whether you're worshiping with us online. Uh, thank you for coming this morning um, as we gather to worship our awesome God, our God that is stronger, uh, that is more powerful, um, that is with us, um, that helps us in that victory um, that we can live in. So it's great to have you here um, this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, if you ordered um, some uh, CWC merch, some clothing, some sweatshirts or whatever, um, they are available to pick up if you haven't already picked them up in the room across from the drinking fountain upstairs. Um, they're laid out with your um, name and, and order form there so you can pick those up after church. Um, also, a new ministry is going to be starting up this Sunday or this Wednesday night. Um, mom's Connecting. Um, so if you know a mom that uh, is in need of connecting with some other moms, um, uh, invite them. There's some postcards that you can hand out to, to people. Um, and um, we're looking forward to how God's going to use um, that, that ministry. Um, also, don't forget next Sunday, right after church, we're going to have a, a church meeting um, talking about uh, the possibility of, of hiring a part-time uh, children's pastor. Uh, and so we're going to be voting on that. The, the board is recommending that, and we'll have some discussion and talking about that. So we'll be praying about that um, and stick around after church for, uh, for that. Also, I think we have um, some winners to announce of, on last week's uh, Trunk or Treat event. All right. I am super excited about this. <laughs> so, as I said last week, um, all of my spots got filled, and I was so excited. What you might not have known is that I had over 10, I can't remember exactly how many, but I had several random people that came in to do the trunk or treating. I had several mystery judges. 
And they went around to the trunks, and I had three different categories that I wanted them to evaluate. So I have some awards to give out this morning. First, this category was the most fun. It's the best use of trunk space. This is presented to John and Pam Vanderberg for their M&M's trunk, and they get an Amazon gift card. So if you are not here this morning, I will leave it in the office, and you can pick it up at your convenience. But they get an Amazon gift card. All right, the most unique award goes to Robin Stark and Gretel Wenzel. You get a Duncan card. Their cat was really awesome. If you see it in the slideshow, it's really cool. Now we have one that was the best overall. I don't think this one's here this morning either. But this one, they get a reserved parking spot out front for the entire month of November, as well as an angry garlic gift certificate. This goes to Peggy Link for her shells on the beach trunk. So these will be left in the office for you. And then we have some gift baskets for the new families that entered for our giveaway. We had 29 new families that registered. So we've got, aren't these cool? All right, so Stacy, do you know what one we wanna do first? Doesn't matter? Okay. So the one that has the Duncan card in it and lots of cool pumpkin stuff. Our winner is Kelly Precourt. Hopefully I'm saying that correct. We will have this delivered to you at some point this week. Congratulations, Kelly. And now our McDonald's gift card basket. <clears throat> Tiffany Sparks. And that will also be delivered. Thank you to all of our new families that registered. And thank you to everyone who came out. All right. You didn't know you were going to see the wheel of from fortune on, on Sunday morning when you came to church, <laughs> did you? But that's, uh, that's the new way of picking a name out of a basket, right? There's an app that you can download to, to randomly select people uh, for different things. And um, so be continuing to pray for um, uh, Several families wanted to know more about the church, and so we've been in contact with them. And um, uh, for the Bibles that were distributed um, uh, during the trunk or treat as, as well, and just be continued to pray for um, those, those families. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, uh, Paul writes, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Father, we just uh, praise you and we thank you for your presence with us this morning. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together in your name uh, to worship you with our brothers and sisters in Christ as this small community of, of believers that are part of your kingdom. Father, we thank you that, that we do not worship a God that's dead, but we worship one that's greater, that's stronger, that is ever with us, uh, that helps us to fight for victory in the midst of the craziness of, of our lives and the things that are going on um, around us. And so, Lord, this morning as, as we gather together in your house, would you just settle upon us? 
Lord, we live busy lives and we have a lot of things on today's agenda and tomorrow's agenda and this week and our to-do list is long. But Lord, this morning, I pray that we truly would be able to sit at your feet and to hear from you. And Lord, that we would just open our hearts to what you have to say to us, allowing your Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. And Lord, that not only to speak to us, but Lord, to give us the boldness and courage to do what you're asking us to do. And so thank you for what you're going to do, Father. Thank you for your, your faithfulness in times past. And we, we, we love you and we praise you this morning. And I just ask all these things in the power of Christ's name. Amen. If you're able, let's stand and continue worshiping this morning.
when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. Was another in the fire standing next to me? There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? a cross that bears no burden where another died for me there is another in the fire all my dead left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire. Highways 
you believe that this morning? Amen. You're standing there with this blank look on your face like you just sang a song, but you're not so sure that you believe that, that there's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. You may be seated if you believe that. If you don't, still, you know, no. The children are dismissed to head downstairs for uh, junior church at, at this time. But that's what we claim, right? That's what we need to claim as we walk through life, as we go through life, as we have our ups and downs and struggle through the mountains and the valleys and the mountaintops and all of that, that uh, one of the other passages or one of the other um, uh, sayings or that we sang about, right, that darkness bows to the light, right? I mean, we have the light, and Christ is that light, and and. Uh, Satan and evil must bow to light, and we can be victorious in the things that, that we deal with and are going through this morning. 
Well, you thought this morning you were coming to church, but you really came to a 12-step meeting this morning. And if you've ever been to a 12-step meeting, you know that, that it starts out when someone shares, they say, hi, my name is Carl, and I'm a grumbler. See, none of you have been, not many of you have been to a 12-step program. You're supposed to say back, hi, Carl, right? That's how you're supposed to respond back to, to when, when someone says that. And, and so this morning, we, we want to talk about Grumblers Anonymous. And um, over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about gratitude as, as we lead up to Thanksgiving, uh, just talking about gratitude. We, we just saying some things that, that we have to be grateful for. Um, in life. There's lots of things that, that we have to be thankful for. And yet, if we're honest, if we're honest, most of us struggle with grumbling and complaining. We seem to think we have more stuff to grumble and complain about than, than we do to be grateful for. And the dictionary definition of grumble is this, to complain about someone or something in an annoyed way. The biblical definition of, of grumbling is faithless complaining. Faithless complaining. Because of your lack of faith, uh, because of your lack of trust in God, we wind up complaining and whining to ourselves or to others. Please don't answer this question out loud, but what do you grumble about the most? Right? Is it your kids? Is it uh, family? Is it people? Is it situation? Is it work? Is it politics? Is it church? What, what is it that, that you find yourself grumbling about the most? Because the first thing in any 12-step program is admitting it, right? Admitting that, that you have a problem, admitting that it is an issue in your life. And as I said earlier, if we are honest with ourselves and with one another, grumbling is, is a problem for us. It's easy for us to slip into that mode of grumbling and complaining. And we know in the Old Testament, the Israelites were infamous for their grumbling and their complaining. It seems like from the moment that they left Egypt, they began to grumble and complain. Turn with me to, to Exodus chapter 16. And we're going to read a, a couple of verses in Exodus chapter 16 and then Exodus chapter 17. The second book in the Old Testament, the second book in the Bible, Genesis chapter uh, 16. But as you're turning there, I want to read Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. As, as I said, basically as soon as they, they leave Egypt, they, be, they begin to grumble. But, so in Exodus chapter 14, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us up to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So right, they haven't even been out of Egypt for very long. They haven't been free for very long, and we see them grumbling and complaining. And then in Exodus chapter 15, verse 24, we find them grumbling and complaining again. And now Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they came out of Egypt in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The, Lord said, the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. And then jump over to Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 3 again. Again, not too long from what we just read. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for, their, for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? 
And so here we have four different examples in a very short period of time of the Israelites grumbling and complaining. And this morning, we want to look at some dangers of getting into this habit, this dangers of, of grumbling. And that's why we need Grumblers Anonymous to help ourselves and one another in this whole area of grumbling because grumbling is very dangerous to us. Before we jump in, let's just, just bow for prayer. Father, as we dive into this passage of Scripture, and, and it's easy for us to point fingers at the Israelites and say, yeah, they grumble a lot. But I pray, Father, that we would be able to pull truths out of that for us today. And we'd be honest with you and ourselves in, in this area of grumbling. It's easy for us to get caught up in grumbling rather than being grateful, rather than being thankful for all that you've done for us. So speak to us, I pray. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Five things that this morning, five or six things that we want to talk about of, of some dangers of grumbling and why we need Grumblers Anonymous. First point is we see that, that grumbling applies that you, implies that you don't trust God. Grumbling implies that you don't trust God. Right? Grumbling is a lack of trust in God. In these four different times, three of them we read, or I guess we read all five, four of them, but in all four of these times where we see the, the Israelites grumbling, each time the Bible records the Israelites grumbling, it's, it's in the midst of a problem, but it's also shortly after God has shown up in, in an amazing, in a big way. And yet, yes, they're in the midst of a problem. They're in the midst of a situation where things aren't going very well, but, but they're grumbling. They're grumbling. And, and God has just done something incredible for them. In that passage in, in Exodus chapter 14, where they're grumbling and complaining to Moses and to God, why did you, why did you bring us out of Egypt? We, you should have just left us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. Yes, it would have been, have, would have been a very scary, a very chaotic, uh, a very confusing time as, as they stood between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army coming after them. But what had God just done for them? He had just freed them from slavery from 400 years of being slaves. God had just freed them from that. And yet, rather than being thankful, rather than being grateful, here they find themselves grumbling and complaining, oh, it would have been better for us to, to just, you know, stay in Egypt. And the next one, in, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 24, right, they had been freed from Egypt, and by this time, Pharaoh's army had drowned in the Red Sea. Now they're grumbling because there's no water. Again, not trusting. God had brought them out of slavery. God had, had destroyed the Egyptian army. And now they're thirsty. There's one point some million people. And yes, they, they need water. They're, they're thirsty. But rather than being thankful for what God has done and trusting that God would provide for them again, right, we find them grumbling and complaining. In Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, God had freed them. God had destroyed the Egyptian army. God had provided water for them. And now, yeah, they were hungry. They were, they were hungry. But again, rather than trusting God, they just complain. Not trusting that God could also provide food. In Exodus chapter 17, God had freed them. God had destroyed the Egyptian army. God had provided water for them. God had provided food for them. And now they're again looking for water. And rather than again trusting God, what do they do? They grumble. They grumble and complain, not trusting that God could once again provide for them. Rather than trusting God, we find that they grumble. Again, what about you? What about me? Right? Grumbling shows that I lack trust in God. When I, when I grumble to God about a certain area of my life, it's saying that, that I'm not trusting. It implies that I, I'm not trusting God in that situation. The more we grumble, the more your trust in God declines. It's saying I don't trust God in this particular area of my life. So grumbling, the danger of grumbling that is that it implies that I don't trust God. The second point is, is that grumbling, me, the grumbling messes with my memory. 
grumbling messes with your memory. In your grumbling, you tend to forget what God has done for you in your past. Right? We just talked about how they grumbled and, and they, they forgot that God brought them out of Egypt. They, they, they forgot that God had, had miraculously got them across the Red Sea and, and destroyed the Egyptian army. They forgot how, how God provided food for them. They forgot how God provided water for them. They forgot all of these things and just automatically went to grumbling and complaining. Each time God acted on their behalf, you would think, you would think that the Israelites would have remembered that. And when they faced the next situation, they would have remembered what God had done for them. They would have trusted God. They would have looked to God. But no, they didn't. Right? Grumbling messes with your memory. That's why God over and over in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, but we find it in the New Testament as well, why God tells the Israelites, records it in Scripture for your benefit and my benefit to remember. To remember, right? In your, in, in our, we have to remember what God has done for us. Deuteronomy 7 and 18, do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all the Egyptians. Deuteronomy 15, 15, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. 1 Chronicles 16, 12, remember the wonders he has done, his miracles. And so when we grumble, it messes with our memory. We, we, we tend to forget what God has done for us in the past. And another thing, another way that, that grumbling messes with our memory is that in our grumbling, we tend to romanticize the past. Look at it in, in, in Exodus chapter 16, verse 3. So here the, the Egyptians are, are grumbling, right? They, they're, um, uh, they want some different food. And in, in Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, the Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. Really? Is that really what happened when they were in Egypt? That they had pots of food and they ate, or pots of meat and they ate everything that they wanted? Is that, was that really the case? Turn with me to Exodus chapter thir- 3. Let's, let's go back and, and take a look of, of, of what, what reality was. Right? Yes, that's what they romanticized, right? Grumbling, we, we have to romanticize the past. But if you look at Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey in the home of all those ites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I go and send you to Pharaoh. Does that sound like they sat around with pots of meat and ate everything they wanted? I, I don't think so. Right? I mean, look at, look at some of the, the words that, of how God is describing their condition. Misery. Crying out. Suffering. Oppression. Those words don't tell me that they had pots of meat and ate all they wanted. See, when we grumble about the present, when we grumble about the present, when we grumble about things, we, we have to romanticize the past, right? When you grumble about the present, you have to make the past seem better than it was in order to justify your grumbling now. Right? When we grumble about this generation of, of children or, or this generation, right? we then have to romanticize about our past, about how great that was, and then we forget all the difficulties back here, right? It wasn't all that way back then when you were growing up. Right? And, and so grumbling, we, it messes with our memory. It, 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 we, we forget what God has done for us, and we wind up having to romanticize the past. The more you grumble, the worse your memory gets. 
A third danger of, of grumbling is that grumbling affects or infects others. Exodus 16, verse 2. It says, the whole Israelite community grumbled. The whole community grumbled. I don't think all of a sudden some switch went off and the whole community all at once grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Right? I think it started with a small group of people and those people grumbled, and then other people overheard them, and they grumbled to other people, and they grumbled to other people, and they grumbled to other people. And it infects other people, right? Grumbling is contagious. It, 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 it spreads. Turn with me to, to Numbers chapter 14. And, and we see this, right? Again, the Israelites hadn't learned their, their lesson at, at all, all through this. They, they continued to forget what God had done for them, and they, they finally get to the edge of the promised land in, in Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. In Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, right? They finally get to the edge of the promised land, and, and um, uh, Moses sends the 12 spies over to, into the promised land. In Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, that night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Now they're changing their tune a little bit. It used to be, oh, if we only died in Egypt. Now it's like, oh, if we only died in the desert. Isn't that what they were, they were saying that was going to happen to them? But now, verse 3, why is it the Lord bring us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children would be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Then you jump over a few verses to verses 36 and 37. So the men, now we see how, how grumbling infects others. So the men Moses had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. These men responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. So we see how, how grumbling infects others. It, it's contagious. It spreads. It started with 10 men. It started with 10 people and quickly, over a short period of time, infected the whole community. Obviously, those 10 men didn't talk to all 1.2 million, 1.1 million Israelites. No, but it, they infected other people. And those people that grumbled and complained and infected other people and so on and so forth. And it spread until the whole community was grumbling and complaining to Moses and about God. And the same today, the same today, when, when you are in the habit of grumbling, it affects, it infects other people. It infects your family. It infects your children. It infects your coworkers. It infects your friends. It infects your church. Right? Rather than spreading uh, a spirit and a sense of positivity, of hope, of anticipation of what God will do, it infects people with fear and dread and discouragement. Right? Rather than seeing what God can do, we, we grumbling focuses on the fear and the dread and this discouragement. Right? I've seen it happen in families. I've seen it happen in communities. I've seen it happen in churches. Right, few people begin to, to grumble, and, and pretty soon it spreads through the whole family, and spreads through the whole community, it spreads through the whole church, and they don't take that step of faith. They don't. They don't do what God is asking them to do. Paul tells us in Second Corinthians chapter two, verses fourteen and six, fourteen through sixteen, that we are to spread the aroma of Christ. Right, that, that we are to be spreading that everywhere of Christ's hope and of His love. And, and what Christ wants to do in us and through us, not spreading and infecting other people with that spirit of grumbling and complaining. So some of the dangers of, of, of grumbling, right, is, is, is that it infects other people, right, that it messes with our memory, that it implies and, and tears down our trust in God. And then fourthly, it, it erodes our hope. Grumbling erodes our hope. I mean, think about this, especially this, this, well, any of these times that the Israelites are grumbling, but especially here in November, no, November, that's in a couple days, Numbers, in Numbers chapter 14, this 
group of Israelites, they are at the edge of the promised land. They are at the edge of entering this promised land that God had promised their, their ancestors and the ancestors before that. And they were about to see the fulfillment of this promise. This promise that they had hung on to all through the 400 years of slavery, that someday we would be in a land of flowing with milk and honey. Someday we would, we would have a land of our own. Someday God would give us this land that he promised Abraham that he would have you know, ancestors, descendants, as, as many as the sand on the seashore. And this group of Israelites, this generation of Israelites, were standing at the edge of the promised land, ready to go in. And yet what? They grumbled. They grumbled, and that grumbling eroded their hope. This promise that God had given to them, right? This promise that, that this land would be theirs, right? This promise that they were fighting from victory, not for victory. Right? Yes, they were going to have to work with God. They were going to have to go in. They were going to have to fight. They were going to have to work. They were going to have to sweat. And all of those types of things. But, but God was giving it to them. Victory was guaranteed. It was going to be theirs. And yet their grumbling eroded that hope. They became hopeless as they continued to grumble. And as that grumbling spread, hopelessness spread so much, so they talked about going back to Egypt. I mean, think about that, right? They, they, they talked about going back to Egypt after all the things that God had done for them. Grumbling ate away at their hope until they were ready not only to go back to Egypt, but in Numbers chapter 14 and 15, it talks about that they were going to kill Moses and Aaron and, and grab another leader and go back to Egypt. Grumbling had destroyed and eroded any hope that they had, even after all the promises that God had, had made them, after all the things that God had done for them, how God showed up in amazing and mighty ways, and yet they still were hopeless that God could do anything in the promised land. Grumbling destroys hope because it gets our eyes off of God and solely on our situation. On, on the walls, on the giants, on, on whatever that situation is, as, as we grumble and complain, we lose hope because it, it gets our eyes off of God and solely onto this situation. Right? The more they grumbled, the less they could see God, and the more they became fixated on the walls, cities, and the giants, and the more they fixated on the walls, cities, and the giants, the, the, the more they, they got their eyes off of God, and, and the more they got their eyes off of God, they lost hope, and, and that lost hope continued to have them grumble, and it becomes this vicious circle right? that one feeds the other, grumbling, it erodes our hope. Another danger, another danger of, uh, of grumbling is that, is that it damages our witness. It damages our witness. Look at this verse in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. It's in your notes. It's also on the screen overhead. I want us to read this passage together. It's from the English Standard Version. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Right. Maybe a little bit different than, than what you're familiar of reading in the NIV or the King James or whatever, right? But it says, Paul says here, reminds the Philippians to do what? All Things without grumbling. All things without grumbling. Right? The world grumbles. That's what the world is all about. The world grumbles. The world argues. And Paul says the world is twisted and crooked. But God calls his children to a higher standard. And when we do things without grumbling, we shine like stars. We, we stand out. It gives people an opportunity to ask us, well, why do you have the hope that you have? Man, you're going through some difficult times. Right? Why aren't you grumbling and complaining? Right? The world is a mess. Our, our country is in a mess. Why aren't you grumbling and complaining? Well, let me just tell you where my hope's at. 
It's not who sits in the White House. It's not what party controls uh, the Congress and the Senate and all that. My hope is in Jesus, right? It gives us an opportunity. We stand out. But when we grumble, it damages our witness because we sound just like the rest of the world. Grumbling, it damages our witness. It hurts our witness. It makes us just like the rest of the world. And how does Paul describe the rest of the world? Crooked and twisted. All messed up. Right? You see a car that's been in an accident. It's, it's twisted, right? It's all messed up. And, and, and that's the way the world is. It's, it's all messed up. And we, as, as God's children, he's called us to a higher standard. To not get caught up in the grumbling and complaining about all the stuff that there is to grumble and complain about. But to give, keep our eyes fixed on God. And then the last point this morning, the last point, the last danger that we want to talk about of, of grumbling is, is flat out grumbling is sin. Grumbling is sin. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 26, and in several other places in, in the Old Testament too, the Lord said, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? God calls them wicked because of their grumbling. And what their grumbling led to, their grumbling led to disobedience. But God calls them wicked because they were grumbling. Grumbling is sin. In Numbers chapter 14, we, we read verses 36 and 37, right? It tells us that, that God punished those ten spies that came back and, and spread the bad report and, and, and started this whole grumbling that infected other people, right? That he punished them. They, they, they died of a plague. In James chapter 5, verse 9, don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. Right? There, there's judgment coming for those that grumble. And in Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter in Jude, but Jude chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, if I just said Jude, verses 15 and 16, some of you would say, hey, you forgot the chapter. Right? But, but it is, it's very clear. Jude makes it very, very clear that grumbling is sin. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in ungodly ways and all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men or these people are grumblers and fault finders. Jude just talks about right, all the ungodly and the ungodly acts and ungodly ways and the ungodly words that they've spoken. And he said these men are, these people are grumblers and fault finders. He makes it very clear in this short letter, right, that, that grumbling is a sin. It's not just something in God's eyes, but it's sin in God's eyes. And so grumbling is a sin. So let me wrap up real quickly. What are some three quick things that, that we can do to help ourselves and to help us overcome this sin of grumbling, this thing that's easy to get sucked into because it's the way of the world, this crooked and twisted generation that, that we live in. How can we overcome this? First of all, we've got to pay attention to your, to your talk. Right? You've got to pay attention to your talk. Right? It's easy for us just to slip into that grumbling mode with it without, without even noticing. Right, but, but to listen, to pay attention to the words that come out of your mouth. Right, your words matter. Your words matter. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. The tongue can bring death or can bring life. That's talking about to other people, our words to other people. But it also is in, in our own spiritual lives. Right, that, that our tongue, if we're grumbling, it's sin. It leads to disobedience. It can bring death to our lives spiritually or it can bring life to our life spiritually. Maybe you need to ask a friend, a spouse, a, a, a co-worker, a neighbor, a, a trusted person to say, hey, listen, listen to my words, not just what I say, but, but how I say it. What percentage of my talk is grumbling? Right? Poke me when I start to grumble. Right? Help me in this area. Right? Pay attention to your talk. A second thing that we can do to help ourselves get out of this grumbling mood is, is Pay attention or be careful who you listen to. Because one of the dangers of grumbling is that it infects other people. And so if you are constantly hanging around people who are always grumbling, then what's most likely going to happen to you? 
You're going to get infected. It's going to be easy for you to start to grumble. Mark chapter 4, verse 24, take care what you listen to. We would do better if we shut off the news, turned off the TV, turned off Fox or CNN or Newsmax or whatever it is that you listen to, and spend more time in the Bible, spend more time listening to worship music, spend more time in Christian books, right? I mean, especially this election cycle, it's all grumbling, right? It's all grumbling. Yes, I know, we need to be educated and and listen to debates and, and those types of things, but come on. You already know who you're voting for. Do you really need to listen to one more debate and to listen to them grumbling, complain about the state of our economy and this person and that? No. We, right, whichever where you're going to vote, you already, most people already know. You sitting here already know. Turn it off. Turn it off. You're educated enough. Right? Be careful who you listen to because grumbling infects those that hear it. Limit the time you spend around the grumblers in your life. Maybe you can't stay totally away, but you can limit it. Make sure you spend more time in the God's Word when you're around grumblers. Make sure you spend more time listening to Christian music. Shut off talk radio. Shut off the other stuff. Be careful who you listen to. And then lastly, focus on all you have to be thankful for. We have stuff to be thankful for. We sang about some of that stuff this morning. And you have your list of things, right? Daily remind yourself of what you have to be thankful for. Maybe spend a few moments each day jotting a list down and then carrying that list around with you through the day. And when you start to grumble, when you start to complain, whip that list out and read, read, re-read that list to yourself. Write it on an index card. Carry around with it. Look at it. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says to guard your heart. That will help to guard your heart. Right? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. So if this is something that God says, I want you to do, is to give thanks in all circumstances, then don't you think that in all circumstances, good things or bad things, God's going to give you some things to be thankful for? Just shake your head yes, because we're almost done and you want to get out of here, else I'll keep talking. Right? So if that's God's will for, for you to have, to be thankful in all circumstances, he's going to give you some things in the bad circumstances and the good circumstances for you to be thankful for. And we have to look at those. We have to focus on those things that we are thankful for, that we can be thankful for. Grumbling, it's a slippery, dangerous road. It'll lessen your trust in God. It messes with your memory. It infects others and other areas of your life. It erodes your hope. It damages your witness. And the bottom line is it's sin. It's sin. And so may we strive and work towards being people of gratitude that are grateful for all that God has done for us and all that God is doing for us in the valleys and in the dark times and in discouraging times and and all of those things, right? To to pay attention to your talk, to be careful who you're listening to and focus on all that you have to be thankful for. Father, we just confess that for many of us, it's just easier to grumble. We get caught up in the ways of the world and this twisted and crooked generation that we live in. But Lord, I I pray that that we would be people of gratitude, that we would shine like stars in this grumbling and discouraging world that we live in. Or that that people would recognize that there's something different about us. And that in that, we would be able to share the hope that we have in Christ and that our hope is in you and and not anything that the world has to offer. And help us in in not only sharing, but showing the love of Christ as well in those, those moments to be able to shine like stars. Lord, help us to pay attention to the words that come out of our mouth. Help us to pay attention to to what we're listening to and who we're listening to and make sure that that we're not infected by the grumbling of, of other people. Lord, most of all, just open our eyes to what you have done for us, to remember and to be thankful, even in the midst of discouraging and frustrating times now. 
Lord, may we make sure that you are king of our hearts because you are a good, good God. In your name I pray, amen. As we close the service, let's stand and, and, and sing this prayer, this, this reminder of making God king of our hearts so we can see the good and be grateful for all God has done for us. We serve a good God. We need to be making sure that we are looking for those things to be grateful for and not grumbling about. Father, as we leave this place, may we walk in gratitude for all that you've done for us and remembering that, yes, even in the dark times, darkness bows to light, that in the darkness you are holding on to us and we have things to be thankful for in those. May we fix our eyes on that and be shining like stars in this twisted and crooked generation that we live in. In your name I pray, amen. We are dismissed.